Well, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm pleased to call this uh, hearing uh, to order. Uh, through, though uh, air pollution uh, can be a complex topic, as we all know, um, the goal of this hearing is, is pretty simple, and it's to examine the role that low-cost uh, air quality sensors can play in helping us uh, collect more data uh, about the quality of our air so that we can do a better job of protecting public health and engaging communities in those responses. That's really what we're up to. And today uh, we will uh, discuss how new air quality sensor technology is making it possible for state and local air quality agencies to work with uh, businesses and with uh, their communities. In particular, we're gonna hear about how low cost sensor technology is supplementing existing data gathering and how the technologies are evolving as well as how local regulators are incorporating these sensors into their own work. Low-cost air quality sensors are becoming an important tool in the toolbox of air agencies. But it's uh, important for us to distinguish what their limitations are so that, we can, so that they can be integrated successfully into community-level uh, health, public health uh, initiatives. Uh, as you know, almost anybody can buy one of these sensors. Uh, almost anyone, they cost uh, a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency refers to these low cost devices as they call them sensors. And they should not be confused with monitors that our states use to regulate air quality under uh, EPA guidance. This distinction between sensors and monitors is important. Uh, and so let me just repeat it. Today we're gonna be talking about sensors which are low-cost tools to collect data on specific pollutants. We're not talking about the monitors that states use, our states, my state, other states here, uh, use for regulation under EPA direction. Low-cost air quality sensors are not replacing regulatory monitors. Regulatory monitors are far more uh, sophisticated. They cost tens of thousands of dollars and are the backbone of EPA's ability to regulate air quality across uh, this country of ours. Many of us already have low cost air quality sensors uh, in our own homes and carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors sniff the air and alert us when a problem is, uh, is detected. The air quality sensors that uh, we're gonna discuss today work pretty much the same way. And as members of this committee have heard me oftentimes say uh, everything I do, I know I can do better. I think that's true for just about all of us, and it's also true for reducing air pollution. We as a nation can and must do more to address pollutants in our air. In spite of our nation's significant strides since passing the Clean Air Act of 1970, air pollution still negatively impacts far too many Americans, especially in low-income communities, and, uh, and including communities of color. The Center for Air, Climate, and uh, Energy Solutions found that people of color are disproportionately exposed to an air pollutant called fine particulate matter, also known to most of us as soot. And exposure to these small but powerful pollutants is linked to lung and heart problems, especially, especially for uh, our kids or people with chronic respiratory diseases. The good news, the good news is that low cost air quality sensors can help detect this kind of pollution. And those sensors are still, uh, those sensors are being used appropriately in a growing number of, uh, of communities. Uh, I believe we have a moral obligation to ensure that all Americans, no matter what their zip code might be, are free from the burden of pollution, air pollution in particular. That means equipping communities with tools to improve individual access to information about the quality of their air. Sensors help us do that. Some of you uh, might uh, recall that this uh, committee held a hearing in July of 2022 that discussed uh, the risk of living near or downwind of facilities that uh, emit uh, air pollution. Harmful air pollutants disproportionately affect these so-called frontline communities. 
But many Americans today do not even know they are being exposed to dangerous levels of, of air pollution. And that's why sensors are critical, because they sniff the air and det detect the pollutants that the human eye or the human nose cannot detect. And this technology is, is getting better and more affordable uh, by the day. Collecting local air data helps states, it helps tribes, it helps communities find pollution hotspots and identify facilities that may be generating excess pollution. Low cost sensors also save air agency monies by enabling them to direct resources to where the worst pollution is, uh, as I oftentimes say, find out what works and do more of that. Today, we will hear from one of our witnesses about what is working with low-cost air quality sensors in, among other places, Denver, Colorado, one of the best examples of a local air agency working proactively with healthcare organizations, with schools, and with neighborhoods. In other places across our country, cities and local groups are working with their air regulators at the state level. For example, Utah's Department of Environmental Quality is partnering with the University of Utah as well as with other state and local organizations to stand up a new air quality sensor program on the west side of the Salt Lake Valley. This program will provide uh, almost, almost instant local air quality information through air maps and through uh, alerts. These uh, sensors uh, complement regulatory monitors. For example, during the wildfires last uh, summer in uh, Delaware, the Delaware Department of, of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, we call it DENREC, Delaware Department of Natural Resources uh, and Environmental Con Control, DENREC. And uh, DENREC used, uh, used uh, data from 11 regulatory monitors, data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and data from low cost sensors to attract air pollution. Using all three sources, uh, DENRAC was able to quickly issue public health advisories for vulnerable residents. In closing, <clears throat> clean air is good for human health. It's good for our economy, and it's good for our planet. It's good for all of us. We look forward to a hearing uh, today from our uh, uh, colleagues as they arrive and uh, from our witnesses on the ways in which low-cost air quality sensors can help us reduce air pollution and protect public health. Uh, before I turn to Senator Caput, I, I want to thank our, uh, not just our witnesses for being here and testifying today and preparing for, for this hearing. I want to thank uh, our, uh, our, uh, our staff for uh, helping to find you and to convince you to come today and to share some thoughts and respond to some of our questions, but we appreciate good to staff work that's been done. With that, now let me turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening statement. Senator Capito, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Carper, and thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, and I appreciate the travel, and I appreciate the expertise that you will bring. You know, I think we can all agree that clean air is vital uh, to the health and well-being of Americans across the nation. Um, however, I am a bit concerned about the administration and in, in, in some of the neglect I've seen in the major flaws in the air monitoring data quality. It seems as though the administration is prioritizing an agenda while misallocating taxpayers' dollars on projects that have limited benefits to our public health and welfare. First, I think it's important to acknowledge that Americans enjoy some of the cleanest air in the world. And, just, uh, and recognize just how much air pollution in the United States has been reduced. According to the EPA, uh, between uh, 1980 and 19, or in 2022, the combined emissions of uh, criteria air pollutants and precursor pollutants was reduced by 73%. Hazardous air pollutant emissions have also similarly declined. Despite this fact, many Americans are led to believe through inaccurate claims uh, that our air quality is getting worse when, in fact, air quality has significantly improved and can get better. Congress has made significant investments to support the Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Network. The federal government partners with states, localities, and tribes to build and operate the system. This network 
is comprised of official stationary air monitors that gather data to inform regulatory decisions and determine regulatory compliance. While use of these official monitors has been generally successful, deficiencies with one model's accuracy and reliability demonstrate the need to ensure that the monitoring system is maintained at the highest standards and is the most accurate it can be. One year ago, EPA modified a measurement method on the Teledyne PM mass monitor used to track and measure particulate matter. These mo monitors are crucial to inform potential regulatory actions undertaken by the EPA and the states including implementation of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or the NACs. Peer-reviewed analysis reported that the monitors had led to overinflated measures of fine particular matter, or PM 2.5. In other words, the monitors led the EPA and states to believe that the air quality was actually worse than it actually was. These artificially high readings date all the way back to 2017 when they were first deployed. Those Teledyne monitors had a significantly high bias relative to other monitors, including the gold standard reference monitors that the uh, chairman spoke about. On February 14th of this year, the EPA proposed a, uh, issued a proposal to retroactively modify uh, PM 2.5 data reported from the Teledyne monitors from where they were first deployed from the years of 2017 through April of 2023. The EPA proposal notes that more than 400 Teledyne monitors in our official Air, air monitoring network were consistently producing PM 2.5 data that was 20% higher than the real concentration levels. To be clear, this level of inaccuracy is, 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 could be stated as unprecedented. It is absolutely critical that EPA prioritize correcting this unprecedented error, which they are doing, and refocus on high-quality, accurate monitoring data that is relied on for regulatory compliance. This is where the EPA's focus should be in a monitoring context before the agency promotes the use of emerging and less accurate sensors. Despite the challenges faced by the existing network used for regulatory purposes, um, there has been a choice to pr prioritize funding for less accurate, difficult to use low cost monitors. The uh, Partisan American Rescue Plan and Inflation Reduction Act funded the use of less accurate and reliable low-cost air quality sensors. A recent GAO report identified key challenges and data deficiencies associated with those of those low-quality air sensors. GAO found that users face difficulty understanding the capabilities, operations, and maintenance requirements and accuracy of those sensors. Particularly, GAO noted users often lack the knowledge to select the right sensors or deploy them in a way that best fits their intended use to gain accurate and actionable data. This leads to confusion when the data lacks the high degree of confidence ne necessary to make regulatory decisions and can cause misunderstandings about the concentration of air pollutants that are affecting our local communities. A particular concern, GAO points out that the EPA has not taken basic steps to address issues with sensor use, such as issuing guidance on how to make the sensors more usable for communities. This confusion can undermine confidence in EPA and state regulatory actions, as well as cause our communities and residents to panic about their air quality and misallocated resources. I am concerned that spending more money on new, unproven, and inaccurate monitors that can't be used reliably to direct our regulatory action will at best be a waste of money or a misplaced priority. Instead, we need to make improvements in the existing monitoring network so that we can build on the substantial progress that we have made to improve our air quality. With that, I yield back, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Um, all right, we're now gonna turn to uh, our panel of, uh, of witnesses. I had a chance to meet all of you uh, personally and to welcome you, and we're delighted that uh, you were able to come today. Um, and. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm going to start off uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Omar Hamad. Is that true? Has anyone ever mispronounced your name? <laughs> okay. We'll try not to do that today. Mr. Hamad uh, is an analyst uh, in environmental policy in the research science and industry division of the Congressional Research Service, which does such great, uh, great service for all of our country and certainly for folks on, uh, in, on this committee. Uh, uh, I understand that your work focuses primarily on uh, environmental policy issues, including the Clean Air Act, uh, indoor air quality, 
the National Environmental Policy Act and environmental uh, permitting. Uh, before joining uh, CRS, Mr. Hamad uh, worked in the Air Progress Branch at the Environmental Protection Agency in Region 2. Region 2. In this role, uh, uh, Region 2. And our second witness is uh, Mr. Bill Oberman. Mr. Oberman, good to see you. Uh, Air uh, Program uh, Supervisor at the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, in this role, I'm told that Mr. Oberman manages the uh, Denver Department of Public Health and Environment's Love My Air Program. I love that title, Love My Air Program. Uh, love My Air is a city-led air quality monitoring program that provides real-time air quality information and in education to residents of Denver. Mr. Oberman has been with the city since 2019, but has uh, over 25 years of experience in air quality and transportation planning uh, industries. Third, last but not least, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Ms. Ann Austin, uh, and uh, who I believe is from Austin. And, <laughs> and this doesn't happen every day. It's pretty cool. Uh, but we're going to hear from, uh, from you, Ms. Austin. I understand you're the former principal deputy assistant uh, administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at the Environmental Protection Agency, and also a former EPA Region uh, 6 administrator. Uh, prior to joining uh, EPA, Ms. Austin spent her career working for the Texas state government. What did you do working for the Texas state government? I served at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and also at the Texas General Land Office. All right, thank you. Um, well, we thank all of you again for, uh, for your preparation. Uh, we thank all of you today for your service and for joining us here today to, to testify and to respond to the questions uh, that, we, that we have. And uh, Mr. Hamad, I'm going to ask you to please uh, lead us off or lead off hitter and uh, proceed with your statement uh, if you're ready. Thank you. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee, good morning and thank you for this invitation to appear before you on behalf of the Congressional Research Service. I'm Omar Hamad and I'm an analyst in environmental policy. My testimony draws on my area of specialization at CRS, the Clean Air Act and air quality monitoring. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, defines low-cost air sensors as a class of non-regulatory technology that is lower in cost, portable, and generally easier to operate than the air monitors used for regulatory purposes. Some stakeholders have asserted that EPA, state and local air agencies, should consider the use of low-cost air sensors in their regulatory regimes due to competitive costs, increasingly better technologies, and expanded coverage. This testimony summarizes my written statement that I offer for the record and aims to introduce and address the elements of this debate. I will discuss ambient air monitors, also known as regulatory monitors, and their uses, low-cost air sensors and their uses, and the benefits and challenges of both technologies. Congress recognized the need to address air pollution, establishing the Clean Air Act with the purpose of protecting and enhancing the quality of the nation's air resources and providing assistance to state and local governments in connection with the air pollution prevention and control programs. Under the Clean Air Act, EPA is to issue national ambient or outdoor air quality standards, known as National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs for short, for criteria pollutants. There are currently six criteria air pollutants, particulate matter, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. Establishing NACs does not directly limit emissions or compel specific emission controls. Rather, it represents EPA's formal judgment regarding the level of ambient air pollution that will protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Ambient air monitoring is the systemic long-term assessment of pollutant levels by measuring the quantity and type of pollutants in the surrounding outdoor air. The Clean Air Act directs EPA to promulgate regulations that establish an ambient air monitoring system throughout the United States. Regulatory monitoring sites established primarily by state and local air agencies will differ from site to site in the number and type of required monitors 
and pollutants monitored at each site. These monitors must meet EPA-designated reference or equivalent methods for monitoring. Regulators, researchers, communities, and others have relied on the network of ambient air monitors to provide the data needed for studies, source permitting, NACS attainment and implementation, air quality alerts, and a host of other applications. Low-cost air sensors, unlike ambient air monitors, are non-regulatory and relatively low-priced devices, often priced below $2,500 compared to the regulatory monitors that can reach prices of up to $50,000. Advancements in technology, microprocessing capabilities, and miniaturization have led to an expansion in the availability of low-cost air sensors to measure a variety of air pollutants. According to the U.S. Government Accountability Office, the use of low-cost air sensors is increasing, driven in part by policy and public interest in air quality stemming from wildfire smoke, neighborhoods near pollution sources, and other concerns. EPA is involved in the advancement of low-cost air sensor technology, including performance evaluations and best practices for effective use. EPA found that these low-cost air sensors are generally less accurate than their more expensive regulatory counterparts, and stated that data from new air sensor instruments should not be used in a regulatory context at this time, unless those instruments meet all applicable regulatory requirements. EPA did note that they could be used in identifying pollution hotspots, providing local community scale air monitoring, assisting in the site selection for new or relocated regulatory monitors, and conducting scientific research. Ambient air monitoring networks have provided reliable air, reliable air quality data throughout the country for decades. In recent years, some observers have raised concerns about the increase in costs to establish and maintain regulatory monitors. Some states and local air agencies assert that low-cost air sensors have been successfully used to supplement regulatory monitors and fill data gaps. Some contend the sensors help decision makers address specific needs, such as directing limited enforcement resources to achieve emission reductions, saving time and money. Federal agencies have also made low-cost air sensors available for deployment to wildfire locations upon the request of firefighting agencies. Stakeholders have noted the low-cost sensors have been particularly useful for monitoring wildfire smoke in areas without regulatory monitors. This concludes my brief remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Mahd, we thank you uh, for, for your testimony. We we'll look forward to asking you some questions in a couple of minutes. But let's now turn to Mr. Overman, and Mr. Overman, please proceed. Welcome. Yes, good morning. Turn on your microphone, please. Yeah, we want to hear every word. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee and fellow panelists. My name is Bill Oberman, I go by Bill, and I'm an Air Program Supervisor at the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. I manage the Denver Love My Air Program, and it's a program that uses air quality sensors to generate real-time pollution measurements for the residents of Denver. Denver's been in non-attainment of the EPA standard for ozone since the early 90s. Add in our population growth, wildfires, and the unique geography of our city up against the mountains, and you have a persistent ozone pollution issue, as well as other pollutants like PM 2.5, which is fine particulate matter, 2.5 millionths of a meter in diameter, as you know. Ozone and PM 2.5 drive our air quality index in Denver and the alert system that's then operated by the state. It's as common to check the air quality index and scan for air quality alerts as it is the weather on a typical summer day in Denver. This is the context in which the Love My Air program exists today. It's an example of how local governments are responding to educate the public about health and air quality. We take real-time data from our sensors and display it on TV screens in 33 Denver public schools. We also have a smartphone app and public website for any member of the public. Our information is easy to consume and timely. For example, nurses use our information when caring for asthmatic children on high air pollution days. Our program started in the schools and what we learned is the most responsive population were the nurses. It's best to use these trusted partners to help build more awareness around air quality and health. 
And today we're expanding our program into three local health clinics because they too are trusted partners in health. So here we are at a pivotal point. Sensors are providing more information on air quality and the official monitoring equipment used by EPA and state agencies is also becoming more affordable and ready for real-time display. So the big questions are, how can these monitoring technologies be used to improve health outcomes? And from our perspective, there's two ways that Congress can help. The first way is to direct EPA to establish how air quality monitoring data from programs like ours can be used to complement state analysis and decisions on where to further reduce air pollution, especially in ozone and PM 2.5 non-attainment areas. EPA has been issuing guidance, uh, as Mr. Hamad said, on how to operate sensor technologies and networks and performance testing of different sensor technologies, and all that assistance has been very helpful. And Denver corrects its sensor data using the state monitoring network and using some of those EPA protocols. We agree with the GAO report that there is clearly an emerging need to take the next steps in clarifying how our data can be used in a regulatory context. This is even more relevant with the EPA's newly revised annual standard for PM 2.5. Second, we need to understand how local air quality data captured near large industrial facilities, like refineries, can be used. EPA has guidance that details how this data needs to be collected so it can complement, but not replace, air monitoring conducted by state and federal agencies. Today, our air sensor data would not be considered high enough quality to use in an enforcement setting, and we agree with that conclusion. We use our data almost exclusively today as a public health education tool. But these monitoring technologies are constantly improving, and we will continue to get pressure from our residents on how to take action with this data in a regulatory context. We are only a few short years away from collecting high quality data at a large scale in our neighborhoods and neighborhoods all over the country, particularly those adjacent to industrial sources of air pollution. I wanna reiterate that EPA has been a great partner thus far by establishing data quality standards, by um, publishing things like the Air Sensor Toolbox online available for everyone. We ask that the EPA continue to work directly with us and states to start to answer how sensor data can be used in air quality planning and assessing facility compliance. EPA should continue to support the local level by providing monitoring equipment and even helping us install it on the ground and help us validate our data. The EPA's resources could be increased here as more communities start to use this technology and more of them become available on the market. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify with you today, and I look forward to your questions. You bet. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for, for um, those words, and uh, thanks for what you do with your life. Thank you. Serving uh, our country. Uh, we're now, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Ms. Ann Austin, who is from Austin, and uh, which is, I don't think we've ever had in the years that I've been chairing someone who has a name that just rings, bell, rings a bell like that. That's great. We're happy you're here. And, uh, uh, please feel free to go uh, with the head you through your statements and we'll ask some questions once you finish. Thank you. Welcome. Chairman Carper, uh, Ranking Member Capito and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on the topic of air quality, air quality monitoring technology. It's a pleasure to be with you here today and uh, in such good company with my, uh, with my fellow panelists. As you know, the U.S. has experienced dramatic progress in air quality in recent years, and these improvements have spanned presidential administrations and hold true for criteria air pollutants such as ozone and PM, greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane, and hazardous air pollutants like formaldehyde and benzene. As envisioned by Congress and, as, and embedded in the Clean Air Act, this progress is built on cooperative federalism between the U.S. EPA and its state, local, and tribal partners, as well as a backbone of high-quality regulatory-grade monitors. It's important to note that as our air quality has improved and while the NACs have become more stringent, the contribution of air pollution from forest fires and international transport have grown in significance. This makes a high-quality monitoring network and the ability of EPA and its state and local partners to provide regulatory relief through Clean Air Act tools like exceptional events even more important. Consequently, non-attainment designations for areas that cannot meaningfully address the background, fire-related, or international contributions 
will not address the remaining air quality issues in our country. And this raises the important issue of the current state of technology with respect to air monitors and sensors and where low-cost portable air sensors fit into the picture. As you know, EPA, state, local, and tribal partners have long relied on a robust monitoring network which complies with quality control and quality assurance measures and, quality and data quality specifications that conform to federal reference methods and federal equivalent methods used for regulatory purposes. These monitors are subject to federal regulations, and in short, they are carefully tested, they are carefully calibrated, and carefully maintained because of the important role that data generated from the monitoring networks plays in the regulatory decision-making at the local, state, tribal, and federal levels. Now, the appeal of low-cost air sensors is readily understandable, as they are widely accessible to, in uh, to individuals as well as interested parties. They are good tools with which to explore one's local environment and to learn more about air quality and perhaps may even have a role to play with respect to identifying local air quality issues that merit further monitoring and analysis by a regulatory agency. However, and among other things, the personal air sensors lack quality control and quality assurance measures. They've not been subjected to the same uh, rigorous FRM and FEM testing and analysis, and they may have high levels of variability between the different instruments. In short, they are certainly an air quality tool and they have their place in that toolbox, but the technology has not yet been subjected to the same level of rigorous testing and analysis that the existing monitoring network has stood up to for years, albeit with its own shortcomings. Therefore, low cost sensors may not quite be ready for prime time when it comes to being fully incorporated into the Clean Air Act required network utilized for agency regulatory, permitting, attainment, and enforcement decisions. Instead, it would be worthwhile to refocus our attention, energy, and resources to Clean Air Act programs focused on the most pressing air quality issues grounded in cooperative federalism and focused on a robust, high quality regulatory monitoring network. For one, how federal funds are directed uh, via intergovernmental organizations and state and local and tribal agencies. Uh, all of those organizations have raised long-standing concerns about the relative lack of resources for building and maintaining that robust monitoring network for criteria and hazardous air pollutants. Furthermore, EPA has repeatedly proposed to shift federal resources for PM 2.5 monitoring to a different part of the Clean Air Act, which would limit federal funds, require a 40 percent cost share for states, and potentially divert state and local resources from other priorities. Fortunately, these proposed shifts have, have yet to be implemented. Third, you've also seen the reduction of key state, local, and tribal experts on EPA air quality programs um, and with respect to the science advisory boards. This should also be reversed to ensure that the proper perspective and leveraged expertise is provided when these decisions are being made at EPA. Fourth, there is a significant need to address comparability issues between FRM and FEM uh, standards to mitigate challenges for future PM NACs attainment designations. And fifth, as Ranking Member Capito highlighted, there's a clear and present need to address positive biases identified in the EPA's air quality system. This is critical given the recently updated PM 2.5 primary standard and the type timeline under which states must provide initial area designations and subsequently craft state implementation plans. In conclusion, while personal air sensors can be useful tools to better understand our air quality and they may be useful in indicators, they are not dispositive. The existing air monitoring network, which we rely upon for regulatory decision making, deserves our far greater focus, energy, and resources now and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony, and I stand by for your questions. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to uh, telegraph my pitch. I'm going to uh, give you an idea what I'm going to ask uh, next. But first, I'm going to ask a, a question to, uh, about FRM, FEM standards. But before I do that, um, one of the things we uh, try to do in this committee is uh, look for consensus. Uh, and sometimes it's not that hard to find. Other times it's pretty hard, and we have to work at it, uh, uh, especially uh, diligently. Um, the, uh, the question I'm going to ask you, uh, after I ask you to tell, talk to us about uh, FRM, FEM standards, uh, the question I'm going to ask you is, where do you think there's agreement among the three of you? Where do you think there's agreement among the three of you on the relevant issues before us? Where do you think there's uh, disagreement? And uh, how might we uh, reduce that disagreement? 
So uh, we'll, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Austin, um, FRM, FEM standards, not everybody knows what, what we're talking about. Just give us a quick primer. I, I would be happy to. Thank you for the question, Senator Carper. Um, FRM standards, the federal reference method, is considered the gold standard by EPA as it relates to monitoring networks. Very rigorous um, testing and analysis is, is required for that, to, um, for that label to be attached to a monitor. And FEM is, a, uh, is, is an equivalent method that EPA can also de uh, designate to monitoring technology when new ones come online and as technology continues to innovate. Um, uh, and then you've got uh, the more recent advent of the low-cost air sensors, which are not subject to those two types of federally recognized and required um, uh, methods of analysis and data collection. So the FRMs and the FEMs are standardized. Um, the low-cost air sensors are not at that place yet. Um, and quite frankly, understandably so. I think one thing that everybody on the panel could agree on is that uh, technology uh, innovation within this space is a good thing. Um, we want to continue to innovate. Um, the better data, better technology that's at a lower cost is good for the public, it's good for the U.S. taxpayer. Uh, but at the same time, um, rushing lower cost technology for the sake of something new uh, does not necessarily put us in the right position from a regulatory standpoint to ensure that we have uh, maintained that public trust and confidence that when regulatory decisions are made, it's on correct data um, and that it's going to be durable. Uh, so I hope that helps. Yeah, it, it does. Let me ask you uh, the same question. Uh, it's just for your thoughts on, on this, uh, this question, Mr. Mr. Oberman, and then uh, uh, Mr. Hamad. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe Ms. Austin is correct. Um, we, we do have a, a, a problem with our air monitoring network, the regulatory monitoring network. It is, it is in need of attention. Our, our state program maintaining these uh, pieces of equipment, some of them decades old, there, there is need for funding there and attention. No doubt about it. We're, we're on those monitoring locations, co-locating our air sensors to um, ensure that our sensors are reading correctly. And so I see that equipment a lot in the field. And uh, the, the need for those programs to be fully funded, especially as we are now in, um, uh, in, in Denver and other cities looking very carefully at the new annual PM 2.5 standard, those regulatory monitors will be dependent on more than ever. So I think there's some, some consensus there. Um, are there other questions I can answer for you there? Well, no, no, that's, that's good. Thank uh, Mr. Maud, same, same issue. Anything you'd like to add, take away? So I'll just say, according to EPA, the federal reference methods are designed to provide the most fundamentally sound and scientifically defensible concentration measurements. So they serve as the basis of comparison upon which all other judge, to judge all other measurements. The FEMs are intended to use innovation and innovative technology to provide comparable levels of monitoring as FRMs. FRMs and FEMs will differ from low-cost air sensors because they will undergo technical and administrative reviews. A lot of quality assurance is going to go into them. A lot of testing is going to go into them. Low-cost air sensors, there are no standard method for testing, data collection, or siting. They provide data that's non-uniform, non-standardized. But again, depending on who's using it and for what the data is being used, they could provide insights into further information that might be needed. However, we don't differ in terms of what the FRMs and FEMs are meant to do and their use and benefits, and we can agree all on that. How would you explain that to your grandmother if she was on this <laughs> panel and sitting up here with, uh, with us? How, seriously, how would you explain it to your grandmother? Is your, are your grandmother still alive? And they passed away. Oh, that's too bad. Oh. That's too bad. How, but but it, they're listening. So. so if I was going to explain it to my grandmothers, I would tell them that there is, for regulatory purposes, the government is going to use for their monitoring, monitors that they check, double check, and triple check, assess the network, assess how they're laid out, assess how they collect the information. They co-locate monitors to make sure that they're operating the way they're supposed to operate. 
they make sure that the data they're getting from these are useful and accurate to a degree where if there's something off, they can assess what's off and correct it as well. Uh, and they have important uses and purposes. They last for decades. Um, the tech information we get from them is a very important and reliable source of data. Low-cost air sensors, like other emerging technologies, um, my grandmothers saw you know, the invent of cell phones, and they saw how they you know, came to be. Um, but like all in technology, with the, with the advancements in microprocessing and the miniaturization of data and technology, these low-cost air sensors have become smarter. They've become better tools to do what they're meant to do. Well, I'm, I'm sure that your grandmothers are looking down and saying, that's our boy. So <laughs> <laughs> let me yield to uh, thank you for those, that response. Um, and uh, now, Senator Capito. Thank you. Um, my first question uh, was going to be to Mr. Hamad, but I think you've already answered it, and that's the difference between uh, in the technology and quality. I think we've established that on the federal reference monitors and then um, the portable uh, uh, low-cost so I, th I think we, we pretty much understand what that is. It's a licensing thing. It may, it's an accuracy thing. So I brought up uh, Ms. Austin in my comments about these Teledyne. Uh, so I'm a bit confused because everybody's saying that, none, that these low-cost air monitors are not being used in a regulatory environment. And I have a map here that shows the, uh, the um, regulatory monitors and then in the blue, it has the Teledyne monitors, which are meant to augment, I think, what's going on in the, in, with the uh, regulatory monitors. So are, are, are you telling me that these blue dots don't really have any effect in terms of uh, finding data for regulatory purposes? Uh, so my understanding is that they do, in fact, have, um, have and have been used for regulatory purposes. Um, as I'm sure you all know, that EPA recently proposed um, uh, an update for the PM 2.5 data from T640 and T640X PM mass monitors manufactured by Teledyne and have proposed to actually retroactively apply the network data alignment equation to all of the hourly unaligned um, monitors in uh, EPA's air quality system uh, for so data. So let me just stop you there. Sorry, I'm thinking yes, about yes, the grandmothers. <laughs> uh, and I'm thinking what, what that's saying is what I think I'd say, I said in my opening statement is that they have to recalibrate their data because yes. it was inaccurate. That is correct, going back to 2017. And the reason why that is so important is because as you're looking at uh, NAC's uh, designations and you know, whether or not an area falls in or out of mm -hmm. attainment mm -hmm. uh, or stays in attainment is critical to states. So the, yeah, okay. So the reason for that being, um, and uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll use the state of West Virginia okay. as an example. As I understand it, you have some monitors that are showing that uh, you've got uh, 9.1, 9.2 mm -hmm. um, micrograms per cubic meter of PM concentration in different parts of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, if those monitors are Teledyne monitors and are one of the two models that have been used and need to have that information retroactively corrected for the high, uh, the high positive biases that have been uh, recorded over the past six to seven years, that could make the difference right. potentially whether or not those areas fall in into non-attainment or are considered attainment areas. Absolutely. That has subsequent regulatory and economic repercussions right. that could be rather significant. Right, right, okay. So that's the point uh, is, uh, and, and thank you for that clarification. So, um, you know, that it, it, this concerns me because as, as, the, as we see this uh, NAX or the uh, 2.5, um, PM 2.5 moving down, um, those that are on the edge or close to the edge, it's going to have a big impact if there was inaccurate data. So they will be correcting that. But I think it does go to the, um, it, it is going to impact regulatory. I mean, so I, I don't think we can say that these low cost monitors aren't impacting any regulatory data. Is that a true statement? Yes, I would say that they certainly inform, and the EPA would not go through the process of seeking to Redo correct it. and yeah. uh, to to correct the data inaccuracies, right. uh, which I think they do a very solid job laying out the rationale for making that correction. Right. Thank you, um, Mr. Overman. What is the Denver? What What is your uh, particulate matter? Uh, where are you measuring right now? 
where are we measuring in our concentrations of PM2.5? Yes. yes. Uh, we are just below that 9 microgram per cubic meter. So what, like... Depends eight, on what years you're looking at. or or 8.5, or are you way below, or...? Uh, no, we are, I would say, uh, in between 8.5 and 9. Okay, so what Dep impacts is that going to have on Denver's ability to uh, do new projects, economic development, manufacturing? Is this going to have some impacts on that as that moves down and you're close to the non-attainment area? There will certainly be uh, much planning and process if we actually become non-attainment for PM 2.5. Mm -hmm. We don't have that clearly uh, stated yet. That, mm -hmm. That's not a formal declaration that's been made for the Denver area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be multiple counties. It depends on which counties would become non-attainment potentially for PM 2.5. Would there be impacts to business in say Denver County if that, were, if that happened? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There would, there would be control technologies, most likely, that would be implemented at certain types of facilities that are high emitters of PM 2.5. Um, and we would go through a, a extensive regulatory process at the state level, which we do today, it's why I know so much about it with ozone, um, to bring reductions down, not only from industry, but also transportation, from uh, even uh, other practices that aren't that, that generate air pollution that yeah. aren't just at an industry. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's a good point. These, this will have impacts, uh, a lot of impacts on economic development, but so we got to get accurate data, or certainly at, at, at the minimum, accurate data. When you were talking about the, um, your citizens' use of the um, uh, index, mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking back to maybe six, what was it, six months ago when we had the Canadian wildfires I mean, I was following every day what, what the index right. is on this. So I, I really see what the public health implications are to be able to access that. I just pulled up the Weather Channel, actually, when we were talking to see what, you know, if they have it still on there since we're not in a crisis kind of thing. It's all right there yep. uh, so you can see it. Would those measurements be on a, uh, on a regulatory measure or are those on low-cost measures or do we know? Yeah, I'm, I appreciate that question. The... The air quality index that you're viewing through your smartphone, right. while I don't know exactly which one or app you're using, is most likely based on the regulatory monitoring network, the it is. FEM, FRM network. Yeah. Love My Air, for example, uh, in that city program, we do not push air quality alerts out to you don't. smartphone apps or anything like mm -hmm. that. We do have our own AQI generated for our school program, mm -hmm. where when you walk in the school building, it's the conditions outside of the school that's got an air sensor on it. Mm -hmm. Those students, that community does see our AQI calculation, mm -hmm. which is based on EPAs. Mm -hmm. But the mass um, communication of AQI and air quality alerts um, in, in Denver is all handled by the state, and that's based on their reference network. Yeah, yeah. okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. Uh, we've been joined, uh, as I'm sure you noticed, uh, by a couple of senators who've thought a lot about these issues and been very much involved <coughs> on them. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, Senator Mark, you know, recognize you, and then uh, Senator Padilla, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're well into a new information era, but our air quality monitoring systems can be seen to be stuck in the Stone Age. Black, brown, low-income communities that live in the shadow of air pollution deserve better. They deserve to know what they're breathing, and they deserve to have regulators do something about it. To tackle this problem, I introduced the Technology Assessment for Air Quality Management Act, co-sponsored by 11 of my Senate colleagues, which would report on air quality monitors and sensors that provide a holistic understanding of local air pollutant measurements. It would also support additional staff at the Environmental Protection Agency who would provide accessible information, advice, and resources to communities about how to use air quality tools and, importantly, the data which they produce. So, Mr. Oberman, do you agree that low-cost local air quality sensors can complement regulatory monitors finding pollution uh, in fence-line communities that these monitors might miss? Absolutely. 
Uh, Mr. Olbermann, can this information be used to spur action that addresses air pollution in fence line communities and other pollution burden communities? Yes. Thank you. And uh, that, that information could support huh, decisions to issue alerts to wear an N95 mask, to use mass transit, to halt outdoor activities, right, all across the board? It could be used for that purpose, sir? Yes, I think it could be used for that purpose if we had more clarification and understanding with EPA on how to use that data for mass air quality um, alerts through, our, through, through the state's existing system. Yeah, so I would, I would welcome my colleagues' support <clears throat> for my legislation uh, to provide more access to and information on these important technologies. Just getting the information then requires a response to it, but we first have to have the information. As the uh, author of the Environmental Justice Air Quality Monitoring Act last Congress, I fought for the inclusion of funding for air quality monitors and sensors in the Inflation Reduction Act, including $3 million just for low income and disadvantaged communities. And that funding is already being put to work uh, with $2.1 million heading to Massachusetts. And I thank um, the chairman for all of his work uh, on that issue. Uh, the Mystic River Watershed Association received $500,000 for a new network of air quality monitors in Charlestown, East Boston, Everett, and my hometown of Malden. So I grew up uh, breathing uh, dirty air. I lived in an environmental sacrifice ward uh, in Malden, Massachusetts, where there was just a big black cloud. The Malden River was completely polluted. The Malden River was three blocks from my house. My mother used to say, Eddie, whatever you do, don't swim in the Malden River. <laughs> because it was kind of black with a pre-Jimi Hendrix purple haze over it. And when your mother says don't swim in the Malden River, you know that you're not growing up uh, on the Mississippi like you're Tom Sawyer. So did you, did I, you say purple haze? Purple haze. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you for maybe, you know, actually being one of the only people who, you know, remember that great song, by, you know, long ago and far away. Mr. Oberman, in your experience with Denver, Denver's love my AIR program, was it important to have outcomes for communities beyond just the collection of data? Yes, I'd say in the future, we are looking how this data can be used for more outcomes than just public health education and awareness, which is how we're using it today. A big reason we're only using it at that level today is one, the sensor technology is not robust enough to bring into a regulatory context, but that technology is improving. We're about to buy six high quality monitors. They have come down in price dramatically. They are FEM monitors. So they are that higher grade of monitoring technology. And here we are in the city able to buy them and deploy them. So as we deploy those pieces of equipment at health clinics in frontline communities, we will absolutely be looking for how can this data be used in the policy and regulatory space. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oberman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your work in, in these uh, fields. Um, uh, before I uh, turn to uh, uh, our next, uh, next question uh, with, from uh, Senator Padilla, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, materials on the differences between sensors and regulatory air quality monitors. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. All right. Uh, Senator Padilla, how are you doing? Good morning. Doing well, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. And thank you for, the, uh, uh, for organizing this hearing today and the opportunity to discuss air quality monitoring technology, something that the, the state of California has uh, more than 50 years of experience with. Uh, we've maintained one of the most extensive air monitoring networks in the world, actually, not just in the nation, but around the world, which allows us to track progress and identify opportunities to act decisively to protect public health. It's both about air quality, but uh, also about public health. Uh, Mr. Oberman, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership in Denver. Uh, as you know, and as you mentioned in your testimony, uh, in California we have a lot of experience with this, uh, especially in the uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, where they have worked diligently to uh, uh, deploy low-cost air monitoring sensors 
uh, in impacted communities. Uh, my first question for you is, how can we best share these experiences and best practices across jurisdictions and certainly across state lines? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, we are uh, sharing information between uh, the air quality management districts, for example, in, in California frequently. Uh, they're definitely great partners. Um, there's actually a international conference on sensor technology uh, starting April 30th through May 4th, and I know both the air quality management districts will be there presenting. Um, they have great um, staff and, and, and stories um, to tell about how they've been using sensors in those communities, and they serve as a model, really, for the rest of the country. Uh, so we share information uh, just between agencies on occasion, and we also, there, there, are, there are several conferences nationally where uh, we present on our sensor programs to each other. And, and just to be uh, uh, clear, uh, specific, and intentional here, the information sharing, it's not just data that's collected or how it may be interpreted, analyzed, uh, acted upon, but also just evolving technologies and practices, programmatic information exchange? Yes, we definitely exchange information around what technologies we're using, how that data is corrected um, against the regulatory monitoring network, for example, and, and how we use it in our public health and awareness programs. Great. No, and uh, like you, and you have spoken uh, well and eloquently about uh, the need to maintain this as a priority. I appreciate the chairman's leadership and uh, the work of, frankly, Democrats in Congress when we were very intentional in crafting the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to include significant resources to help disadvantaged communities who are disproportionately impacted uh, by uh, poor air quality and tend to have less monitoring capabilities, uh, less ability to obtain accurate air quality data, et cetera. Uh, recent EPA awards have gone to California applicants like the Paula Band of Mission Indians to enhance air monitoring on their tribal reservation. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, recipient has been the Comité Civico del Valle organization to upgrade real-time air monitoring networks in uh, the Salton Sea area of California. And I think the recent influx of funding will enhance monitoring to uh, other underserved communities. Uh, Mr. Oberman, next question for you is, what can the federal government do to make it easier for local or tribal jurisdictions to lessen the learning curve in implementation of low-cost uh, air quality sensors? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, it's to provide boots on the ground assistance. It's for EPA and other technical experts uh, consultants that they have oversight over to be in those communities, helping them not only stand up the sensors, and that's critically important because where is the sensor located, or, or even higher quality monitoring equipment that they could buy. It might not be a low-cost air sensor. Um, like I mentioned, Denver's purchasing monitors that are higher quality. Some of those grants could absolutely go towards purchasing higher quality monitors they're not each $50,000 anymore. So where do you cite those? Um, how do you power them correctly? How do you compile the data? And then even some assistance on what does that data mean for your health? Uh, so there's a lot of, of more assistance the EPA and the states could provide at the local level to show communities what this data really means, especially as higher quality data is collected. Yeah. Can you speak uh, uh, to uh, any uh, specific or additional efforts needed to help avoid improper sensor selection, for example, or incorrect data interpretation, so we can actually uh, uh, just make sure the program is effective, but we build the trust and support from communities that rely on it? That's an important point, and I think with the EPA's first round of community air monitoring grants, while Denver did not receive one, um, I do know that there's a quality assurance plan that they require from those grantees, meaning if you're going to implement this type of sensor in this type of context, what is the quality assurance? How will the data um, 
What, what's the quality of the data that you're planning to collect? And I think that's a really good requirement EPA has put in there to answer that question so that we know what the quality is of these different sensors um, when they're used in these programs. Okay. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one last note, eagerly awaiting your Earth Day playlist. <laughs> Um, one of the songs might have purple in it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right, I have uh, several more questions, but I'm going to yield to uh, Senator Capito. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, um, thank, see you later. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to scoot after I have asked my final question here, Mr. H Hamad. Um, the low-cost sensors have been known, obviously we've talked about this, uh, inaccurately high pollution levels while operating in high humidity or smoky or other less than ideal uh, circumstances. So are, these, uh, are there negative side effects that state agencies face with regard to risk communications or public trust that could result if, if, if publishing inadvertently, publishing inadvertent high uh, pollution levels? What kind of impacts would that have? in terms of trust and communication. Thank you, Senator. Um, I will point out that the Teledyne monitors that you're pointing to earlier, those are regulatory monitors. They're mm -hmm. not low-cost air sensors. Those right, are, okay. Thanks um, for that distinction, yeah. So they are... And they're inaccurate. Those are the ones that need the correction. So those are FEMs, not FRMs. But okay. FEMs and FRMs are both combined regulatory monitors. I see. FEMs use innovative technology mm -hmm. like light and lasers to check optically mm -hmm how much particulate matter is in there, whereas a reference method monitor for PM would use something like a filter that you would send to a laboratory to do, test. Do you happen to know, and this is not the question I was going to ask, but now that we're on this, do you happen to know how that uh, discrepancy was discovered by the EPA? So it was the state air agencies have been pointing to this since roughly 2019, 2020, um, to some of these discrepancies that they were finding because they've co-located Again, they don't have right. just one PM right. monitor or two right. PM monitors, oftentimes three or four PM monitors in their uh, monitoring site. They'll have several of them, and they'll run them to ensure that they're getting accurate measurements. And so the FRMs are what we base in this country. EPA bases everything off of the FRMs. Mm -hmm. The FRMs do not give you real-time data, but they'll give you sometimes 24-hour or three-day, you pull it through a filter, and then you send that filter to the laboratory and it'll tell you how much particulate matter of a certain size okay. exists. Mm -hmm. You use that to then make sure that your federal equivalence method, your FEM regulatory monitor, is reading correctly. So in the T640, T640X corrections mm -hmm. that were noted earlier, EPA pointed to the fact that there had been, according to temperature variations, humidity variations, uh, wildfire smoke issues, um, there have been issues where with uh, low temperatures, high humidity, these uh, monitors, the equivalent monitors, the FEMs, which are still regulatory, were reading abnormal uh, data that wasn't correlating to the FRMs. Okay. And based on the weather data and all the other sensor data that's available at these regulatory monitoring stations, EPA is able to go in and make the corrections based on the location of where you're monitoring stations. And the other data that they have. So, so this has been uh, in front of the EPA since 2019 with, with state monitoring agencies, and they're just now getting around to figuring this out. Well, they needed to then formulate the actual correction equations with mm -hmm. Teledyne to figure out, well, how do they adjust based on location, based on the technical expertise of the people who manufactured mm -hmm. the monitors along with EPA's expertise. They lay it out in their technical support document that they published in that February 14 mm -hmm. uh, Federal Register. Mm -hmm. um, but they had to work with Teledyne and the scientists at EPA had to figure out, well, based to, on your location and how to correct this. Did they put a date on that, like when they would complete that? So the corrections, um, they proposed the correction on February 14, the comment period closed March 14. Uh, they'll finalize it. I don't know when, once it gets finalized is when they'll push out the correction. Mm -hmm. But they have the equations ready to roll out, they'll work with the state agencies mm -hmm. to perform those corrections. Mm -hmm. Well, so it would be very timely with this new regulation coming out to make sure that we're dealing with the correct data. I mean, I think we'd all agree with that. Yep. So anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. Senator Capito, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I understand Senator Kelly is uh, uh, trying to join us today, but uh, hopefully he'll, uh, he'll arrive while we're all still here. Um, I, uh, I have a, a question for 
for for Mr. Oberman. Um, the, the 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 term "love my air" program. I, I love that. That's I think that's really uh, a cool way to label a program, make it live and real. Uh, where does where did that come from? The words came, words actually matter. And I like the choice of those words. Sure. Yes. Thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, our our program name came from our own staff within our. Our department. Um, we were working with our communications group and went through several options and came up with "Love My Air." It's not a very exciting story, but that's that's really where it came from. I was just thinking maybe in, in our, our respective states, love, you come up with something like "Love My Senator." <laughs> 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 well, so I don't know if we could get away with that. Probably not. Probably mm -hmm. not. Um, all right, Mr. Overman. Seriously, now uh, the city of. Uh, Denver is a pretty clear example of how uh, local governments are using uh, low-cost uh, air sensor data to educate the public about health and about uh, air quality. And my question, and I'll have a follow-up to this as well, but my question is in addition to informing students about whether to stay indoors or play outside, uh, how else does the Love My Air program benefit public health? Yes, thank you for that question. The, the ways that Love My Air benefits public health is much more than just sensors displaying information in a, in a public school or, or even emerging now into health clinics. It's not just about the data, it's what does that data mean for students, for the community, for whoever we're streaming that data to. And so we accompany our, our data with a lot of education. And our education is very group and small, small group focused. Um, it's not broadcast to the millions of Denver residents. It's working in classrooms, it's doing teacher trainings, it's doing nurse trainings about air pollution and health. It's, so it's working at an individual level. And we find that's a really successful way to have a dialogue about what this information means and how it's important to either their own personal health or uh, the care that they administer to others, such as nurses. So uh, really our, our air pollution monitoring and the sensor network, it's, it's an introduction to a discussion about air quality. And I would say we probably spend 75% of our time actually working with individuals to understand air pollution and health. Good, thank you. Um, do you know if there are any uh, other ci uh, cities that are replicating the uh, 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 the efforts that y'all have taken in Denver with your Love My Air program? Yes, you there respond, are. Uh, Lookalikes are. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that question. There are there are several others that are replicating our programs. We even licensed that name, Love My Air. So there's. Um, an entity in Wisconsin that's implementing a Love My Air program in Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, some of our adjacent counties in Denver, along Denver's Front Range, are also replicating the Love My Air program and using that same name. But uh, the, the emergence of these programs, particularly in public health departments, uh, is, is rapid. Uh, not only with the EPA grant funding um, to help to help start many of those programs, as you're all well aware of. But also, I'll say this, our Love My Air program is not EPA funded. It never has been. Our, our program was funded initially by, by a generous grant from the Bloomberg Foundation uh, in, nine, in uh, 2018. And, and now we're expanding into health clinics through another grant from the Kaiser Permanente Foundation. So there is a lot of interest, even from grant-making entities other than EPA, to fund these types of programs from a public health standpoint. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you for the, for the record if you could uh, just give us some idea of uh, what uh, other cities that are interested in replicating what you're doing in Denver, who might they, who, who might they uh, contact and how might they contact that person or persons, okay? Yeah, you, don't, you don't have to uh, respond right now, you can just answer, respond for the record. Some of the other people in other cities that are replicating uh, if someone wanted to program? reach out to, uh, to you all in uh, oh, that can in be that can be myself. All right. Yeah, Bill Oberman at, at the Denver Department of Public Health and Environment. All right, it's good. Uh, I like to say find out what works. 
do more of that. Yeah. Right. Um, I'll go ahead and ask, because I think we've sort of answered this, ask this already, but the city of Denver is a pretty clear example of, of how local governments are using uh, low-cost air sensor data to educate the public about health and air quality. Uh, I think we may have already addressed this, but I'll ask it again anyway. In addition to informing students about whether to stay indoors or play outdoors, uh, is there anything else that uh, love my air program does to benefit public health that you want to mention? Love My Air is engaged in a number of policy contexts at the state level. I want to be clear, we don't use our sensor data today in any policy settings like at state air quality rulemakings, but I am involved there quite a bit. And knowing the information that comes from our sensor network plus all the dialogue like I mentioned before, you know, 75% of our time is spent in dialogue with communities, hearing their stories, knowing those frontline communities, bringing their stories and bringing them to air policy, um, air policy convenings at the state is, is critical and, and Love My Air has a big role to play there. So we, while we do not use our data today in those policy settings, um, we certainly bring the voices of those communities that are experiencing that air quality. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Maud, uh, in uh, your written, written testimony, I believe you mentioned that low-cost air sensors have been particularly uh, useful for uh, monitoring wildfire smoke in um, areas without regulatory uh, monitors. Question, how does the federal government uh, use low-cost sensors and their data to inform citizens about healthcare risks from wildfires. Thank you, Chairman. So, led by the United States Forest Service, the Interagency Wildland Fire Air Quality Response Program was created to address risks posed by wildfire smoke. The program was a national, has a national cache of air sensors and other equipment and deploys technical specialists called air resource advisors during large smoke events. Air resource advisors may provide, install, and operate low-cost air sensors and other equipment. Uh, it can be po it was portable in nature. They develop smoke forecasts and share the information with wildfire, wildfire response teams, air quality, air quality regulators, and the public. They also have, as I mentioned in my statement, they have uh, air sensors that they will loan out to firefighting agencies upon request as well. All right, thanks. Um, Beyond uh, Denver, how are other communities and local um, air regulators using low-cost sensors to identify hot spots that need more resources? So some local air agencies have used non-regulatory low-cost air sensors to help direct their regulatory enforcement resources. So they use them to locate hot spots and then implement targeted inspection initiatives. This can be to go after trike idling or to inform regulatory inspections that might happen less infrequently in one location or another. All right, fine. We've been uh, joined by Senator Kelly. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Good Mr. Morning. Chairman. How are you doing? Sorry I'm late. No, you're, you're right on time. I uh, deferred my time to Senator Rosen, so I had to go to the back of the line in uh, armed services. Um, thank you to all our witnesses for being here today. Um, I want to start with um, Mr. Obermann. Um, so air quality, obviously a pressing issue uh, in the West, in Arizona, but really throughout the Western United States. And as I imagine has already been discussed, you know, worsening wildfires, um, interstate and international air emissions have also had real impacts in uh, the state of Arizona, especially when it comes to particulate matter and ozone pollution. Right now in the Phoenix metro area, we're seeing ozone concentrations increase even as the region's emissions of ozone precursors, the chemicals that contribute to ozone, are going down. Mm -hmm. So the chemicals are going down, but ozone concentration is still going up. This means that our region is being pushed into a more serious classification of non-attainment, mm -hmm. 
without having a full understanding of what steps can be taken to bring the concentrations back down. And what leaders in Arizona have been calling for is a renewed commitment by EPA, both at the regional and headquarters level, to focus on the data and science to help understand these new challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I think makes this hearing important today. So Mr. Oberman, I know that the Denver region is also in non-attainment for ozone pollution. Can you speak to some of the regional issues like wildfires in Western states like Arizona and Colorado? Um, and how this makes air quality attainment more challenging and why? Sure, thank you for that question, Senator Kelly. Uh, wildfires are a persistent and major impact to air quality. We have experienced that in Denver, uh, much like other Western cities. And with the new PM 2.5 annual standard, I think the, the need, the pressing need to understand how wildfires qualify as exceptional events will be very important. Um, whether it's called an exceptional event, though, for non-attainment area planning and conformity with the Clean Air Act, it's still a public health issue. Um, wildfires are really, I believe, one of the principal reasons we're here today talking about air sensors, <laughs> because the public is more aware of air quality through the wildfires we've experienced and through the response of the sensor network um, than ever before. And so the, uh, the need for uh, understanding how that data can be relayed to people um, and, and relayed timely and accurately is, is more important than ever. The, the non-attainment issues um, around ozone that we've had in Denver since the early 90s, we agree that much of that pollution is also transported. It's, it's not due specifically to wildfires since we know that wildfires are really emitting precursor emissions to ozone, um, as you mentioned, but ozone is transported certainly from states upwind of ours. And so uh, the more research we do, in ozone pollution, the more we find uh, that that transport we have little control over. So, what kind of what kind of things can we do on the ground that would actually reduce emissions that that emit the precursor uh, pollutants of of ozone? And we're working very hard on that in the Denver region, and um, we'll continue doing so through the next. Decade. How many of these low-cost sensors do you have deployed? We have them deployed in 33 schools, and, uh, Denver Public Schools, and, and, and several others just really for reference network um, and QAQC. And they give you both ozone concentration and pre precursor chemicals? No, they only read PM 2.5, particulate matter 2.5. They do not read ozone, and they do not read other what we would call precursor pollutants like NO2 to ozone. Is, is that because there are, are, are there sensors available that do? Yes. And the reason we use PM 2.5 is uh, partly the age of our program. At the, the time when our program was implemented, PM 2.5 sensors were some of the best technology on the market, the most reliable technology. We can correct it against the reference uh, monitoring network that's operated by the state. Um, so it's not to say that we wouldn't monitor ozone in the future or uh, emissions or uh, uh, pollutants like nitrogen dioxide. Um, we could and we actually will be in those higher quality monitoring um, stations that we're going to be buying this year and next. And what would an ideal system look like of monitoring? Like, what would you want if you could get all the data? How many would you deploy in a city the size of Denver? Yes, thank you for that question. The ideal monitoring system we would deploy would monitor multiple pollutants at the same time, and that's what we are purchasing. Much of the air sensor um, technology available today really monitors one or two pollutants. That's what makes it more affordable. The city um, can purchase multiple monitors that they put in one box, 
and we can purchase up to 10 of those um, over, the, over the next several years and disperse them throughout the city. In a city the size of Denver, about 10 is a good number. Um, and that's partly because some of these pollutants we monitor don't vary tremendously location by location. PM 2.5 doesn't vary tremendously location by location. Ozone is a regional pollutant. So there's not really a need to monitor that on every block. Um, but there are other pollutants like black carbon, nitrogen dioxide, certainly other pollutants that we can monitor today that do vary tremendously location to location. And when a pollutant like nitrogen dioxide or black carbon varies location to location, can you get then uh, infer some kind of vector from it and say, well, since we've got this variation, we can say that it's coming from a certain location or at least a direction? We today do not look at our data that at, at that sort of a time period. We look at trends over, say, the last month or the last year. Um, do we see hotspots in our network, even our PM 2.5 sensor network, when we look at it day to day? Yes. But I wouldn't say that there are persistent, you know, hotspots that we see from our PM 2.5 network today. Uh, we don't know if we're going to see that when we start to implement our NO2 monitoring that I mentioned we're going to be purchasing in the future here. Uh, so the answer is we don't really know yet if we would see a lot of variation in those pollutants, but um, we're going to find out. Well, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, can I have a few more minutes? Or are you ready to wrap it up? I'm ready <laughs> to hear more from you. Okay. Go right ahead. Right, um, Ms. Ms. Austin, um, appreciate the, the, the comments uh, in your testimony about how the EPA uh, and the need to invest in more resources to help regions track regulated pollutants. And I think another important aspect of this issue is developing region-specific models to help air quality officials understand what needs to be done to improve air quality. Can you expand a bit on what kind of costs are involved in developing these regional air shed models? And can you explain why, why modeling for ozone pollution is challenging? Uh, I'm, uh, I would be happy to get back to you on the cost related to regional air shed uh, modeling. I do not have that information before me now, but I'd be happy to get it to you after the hearing. Um, uh, and I would say that some of the general challenges related to uh, regional air modeling um, and uh, the state of Arizona, the state of, Cal uh, of, of, of Colorado, most Western states uh, for something like ozone do present unique challenges given uh, the seasons in which ozone um, are uh, traditionally higher. Uh, your topography and geography can play significant um, uh, roles in uh, how that modeling is done and how it's captured and ultimately how that's reflected in the data. So uh, an ozone challenge in uh, the eastern part of the United States, uh, say down in... Um, uh, the Carolinas or even Virginia, uh, which is right next door, will present probably very differently than it would out in the West. Um, those are important considerations for EPA to be able to take into consideration when it is promulgating policy, when it is recommending changes, when it's reviewing state implementation plans. So um, I definitely think that those are the types of issues that EPA um, endeavors to you know, weigh accordingly and, and appropriately and consider recognizing that a one-size-fits-all approach, especially with something like ozone, is not appropriate just given the chemistry. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're quite welcome. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. I um, have a question for Ms. Austin, but I'm going to delay it until we've heard from Senator Sullivan. Welcome. Good thank to you, see. Mr. Chairman. You bet. And uh, I want to thank the witnesses. Appreciate your focus on uh, this important issue. I wanted to kind of get to the... Uh, PM 2.5 uh, particulate matter issue. Uh, we have a we have a real challenge in the interior part of Alaska. Um, our, we have a non-attainment area in interior Alaska, the Fairbanks area. But the challenge there is 60 to 80 percent of the pollution putting Fairbanks over the 
standard comes from wood burning stoves in people's homes. And we have a unique environment, winter environment there. Fairbanks is kind of in a bowl. And if you've been to interior Alaska, it's really cold, uh, you know, 50 below zero in the winter. And you have um, this kind of inversion challenge. The community's been working really hard to reduce emissions, really hard. But the EPA, in back-to-back -back actions in 2023, um, has started to initiate sanctions against the community for its inability to meet the existing PM 2.5 standard um, and has concurrently proposed to lower admissions and then, really badly in my view, worked with an outside environmental group, I think it was the Sierra Club, or um, without coordinating with the state or the congressional delegation to get an agreement with some far left environmental group on what Alaskans should do really bad uh, uh, approach from the EPA that myself and my Senate uh, and my congressional colleagues have written them about like hey you, you got to check in with the people who are in charge right the state but I, I would like uh, any and all why don't we start with you Miss Austin to um, discuss how a one-size-fits-all approach to monitoring PM 2.5 can be very challenging, but fail community-specific needs. Like I said, the, the um, extreme winter environment, the use of wood stoves to address sub-zero climate conditions, these kind of create a real challenging situation where in Alaska, a lot of times, one-size-fits-all approaches from D.C. just don't work, they don't fit, and we end up spending an en enormous amount of time trying to address that. But do you have any thoughts? And I'll, I'll just go to each of the witnesses. It's really my only big question, but it's a really important one. And this is just a specific example where we have been putting an enormous amount of work and effort into trying to reduce these emissions. We understand the importance of doing that, and yet the unique elements of what goes on in Alaska, particularly in the winter, make it, make it a challenge. Senator Sullivan, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think your characterization of a one-size approach fits all um, is unfortunately, but understandably to some degree, you know, EPA you know, is there to set national standards. Yeah. Um, but you look back to the Clean Air Act, which has that cooperative federalism yeah. approach deliberately embedded in it, which- A lot of times EPA forgets about that cooperatism, cooperative federalism approach, right? Where the states are in the lead. A lot of people don't know that. That's the law. And what I would say to that is, I think one area where EPA has striven to really, you know, do more and should continue to do and probably, you know, up, up the ante a bit is engage with states. Yeah, yeah. Engage, engage, engage. Yeah. You've got, you know, folks- So when the they ground, like it with a national environmental group and do a consent decree without bringing the state of Alaska or the congressional delegation, and you would call that a foul in terms of engaging with the states? I would, I would posit that that is not the way to move forward and actually find a path forward to environmental improvement to benefit public health. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oberman, you have a view on this in general? Sure, thank you for the, for the question. Yes, I'm not as familiar with um, the context in Alaska, but I can say, um, PM 2.5 pollution due to wood burning stoves is is an issue in Denver too. Yeah, and um, you guys have kind of the inversion thing with the mountains. Yeah, you? Uh, Salt Lake City, uh, where I grew up, actually does as well. Um, so there are state rules, and there may be in Alaska as well. I'm not familiar with the regulatory context there. Um, that require certain types of stoves that are EPA certified to be burned. Yeah. Um, the air pollution sensor network that we have in Denver can be a great complement to the public health that those, that those individuals are experiencing in your community, right? They can look at their property's air pollution level and say, what does that mean for my health today? If I'm asthmatic or if my grandmother is asthmatic, like, what does that mean? And, and I mean, honestly, in the context from my perspective, 
what we hear is people need to know what the air pollution is in those communities and why they p potentially feel off that day. Yeah. And, and so programs like ours can help people just get quicker information and understand what that means for their health and even have resources to understand more about air pollution and, and, um, and health if, if, say, they go to our website or, or other means of communication. Good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hamad, do you have a view on this, given your CRS perch? Yes. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Um, first, the state of Alaska and Fairbanks in particular have made strides in their change-out program, and that's where they change out the wood-burning yeah. stoves, and they've developed the program, been leaders across the nation in developing that program. And you know, uh, the EPA is supposed to be certifying those stoves, and they, they haven't done a very good job at that. I don't, know, I don't know what the issues in Denver are, but in Alaska, they haven't done a good job on certifying the stoves. So the certification program works for the manufacturers and the retailers of the stoves. And Alaska joined the Northeast states in a recent litigation action against EPA for their certification program. Just they have some disagreements about the way the method that EPA is would you agree that the EPA is kind of failing in that certification process just from the CRS perspective? So I, I'll say that the states feel that EPA is failing in. Yeah. Alaska and the Northeast states did file suit. Um, CRS is going to give you the facts on that, and right. that's what we'll give you. And the states do feel that EPA needs to update their certification methods for that change out program. Uh, it's the method in which the wood is burned in the oven that they disagree on in the organization. Real world applications versus a test, you know, location are not the same. Right. And that's where the disagreement and discord happens. Good. Um, that, well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, sorry I went over time there, but it's okay. important, important issue, uh, yeah, we're glad particularly you, in interior Alaska. Glad you could join us. Thank you. Um, hi, Ms. Austin. I promised that we were not going to forget you here. And... Uh, I'm uh, going to have at least one question just for you. And uh, I think you agreed that uh, sensor technology is, is improving uh, fairly rapidly. The, um, do you support even more work by EPA to improve the integration of uh, sensor data into EPA's work? Uh, yes, I do, but with the caveat that those resources not be diverted from otherwise maintaining, updating, and correcting the reference monitoring network. Mm -hmm. Would uh, any of the, our other witnesses want to comment as, uh, in, uh, as well on that issue? Anything you want to add, take away? Yes, uh, the air pollution monitoring technologies for our criteria air pollutants, uh, like Mr. Hamad mentioned earlier, the six criteria air pollutants are actually more affordable than ever. I believe there's a path to help states continue their regulatory monitoring efforts as well as also help local communities and governments implement air sensor programs on the ground. I, I think there's space for both. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hamad. So the potential future uses of low-cost air sensors and where it goes from here depends I think on a range of factors, including the state of the technology, whether the improvements have been made and such, uh, the leaps in the technology that we've seen in the last few years have shown that there have been a lot of advancements. In addition, their continued or expanded use may depend on any changes in EPA assessing, assessment regarding their capabilities and whether EPA can determine certain devices would meet any regulatory standards for monitoring. I think that would change the landscape for low-cost air sensors and where they go from here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have a, another question, uh, Mr. Hamad, for, for you, and it's uh, one that deals with funding from Congress. The, um, as you know, Congress has provided funding for, uh, for EPA to administer community air quality monitoring uh, grants through the, uh, the American Rescue Plan and through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, in November, I think it was 2022, uh, EPA selected uh, over 100, maybe 130 some air monitoring projects across some 37 states to receive this funding. And my question is, in, in your testimony, you discuss how uh, low cost air 
sensor uh, projects that have received funding or will receive federal funding. Um, how can federally funded sensor projects ensure a high quality of data? I'll say that again. How can how can federally funded sensor projects ensure a high quality of data? And uh, if you would just please elaborate on the process, the process for projects to undergo quality uh, assurance. And uh, in your answers, just if you would please also describe the type of entities, the entities that uh, received this funding and for what types of projects. Thank you, Chairman Carper. Uh, so according to GAO, there was 132 community air projects that will be conducted by groups including nonprofits, state, local air agencies, tribes, and more than half these projects plan to use sensors. Uh, I included it in my testimony, and the funding recipients conducting low-cost air sensor data collection would be required to submit a quality assurance project plan. EPA refers to these as QAPs. Um, as what? QAPs. <laughs> what does that stand for? Quality Assurance Project Plan, QAPP. Thank you, an acronym for everything. Yeah, I mean, that's the government. Thank you. And so per the requirements of the CFR, uh, the Quality Assurance Project Plan is a written document that provides a blueprint for the entire project and each specific task to ensure that the project produces reliable data that can be used to meet the project's overall objectives and goals. It provides the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the project. And according to EPA, a Quality Assurance Project Plan, a QAP, aims to ensure the credibility of information collected or used by the community air project itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, got a, I got a question, one more question that I think I'll ask for, uh, for, um, uh, for all of you to respond to, if you would. And uh, uh, Ms. Austin, if we could just start with you. The, uh, the, the question is, in uh, closing, would uh, each of you take a, a moment or two and tell us where you see uh, common ground with your fellow witnesses? And if the answer is, we're either further apart than, than we started, that would be too bad. So I, I hope uh, you can identify some, maybe some areas where you, you already had some common ground, now it's maybe more or less, but just, just be, just be really, really uh, honest with us and that would be helpful. And if you go first. Chairman Carper, thank you. Um, I certainly see common ground where uh, technology innovation is going to further reduce costs. Uh, data quality will improve with respect to air sensors. Um, I think that is a you know, very exciting place to frankly be um, as a country. You know, we've seen it in various other uh, technology applications that uh, affect us and make our lives easier in everyday life. Um, I think air sensors are certainly on that train and is moving in the right direction. Um, and I think we can also agree that when it comes to uh, the reference and regulatory monitors that more needs to be done and that those should continue to serve as the backbone for any regulatory decision making uh, at state air, air agencies and at the federal level. Um, and perhaps one day the air sensors will catch up, that they will get to a level to where there's equally robust. Um, I look forward to that day. I hope it gets there. But um, alas, I don't think today is that day. But uh, I think there's a lot to look forward to in both contexts. Good. Thank you. I like that note of optimism. Thanks so much. All right. Mr. Oberman, please. Same Perfect. question. Thank you. Common Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I agree that our reference air quality monitoring network that run by the EPA in the states needs a lot of support and help. Um, it needs to innovate over time as these new technologies become available that are reference quality. We know of several vendors in Colorado that have gotten uh, that stamp of approval um, from EPA to use their monitors as reference level monitors. And that is a very, that's the same process that other makers like Teledyne have used for a long time. Uh, so we know that there is a need, and I agree, to support that monitoring network. The reality is there are many, many areas in our country where we'll never be able to cover it with a regulatory grade monitoring network. The sensors that are available on the market today help fill in those voids. And there are some big voids out there, especially in areas where there are prone to wildfires. So 
we, um, I think, I think uh, an area where we can agree is that that sensor network can absolutely help inform where are some of our air pollution um, pollution challenges changing. So if in some of our more rural communities, air pollution is actually increasing due to things like wildfires, we can know that through the air sensor network so that perhaps we can bring regulatory air monitoring there in the future. So I, I believe there's a lot of agreement here on the panel about sensors kind of broadening that awareness and perhaps uh, for attention with regulatory air monitoring in the future. Mr. Omar. Thank you, Chairman Carper. I think we do agree on the current state of our regulatory monitors and their importance and the information that they've been able to provide the country for the decade, the past few decades has been invaluable. Um, where low cost air sensors are and how they fill these data gaps and help identify um, opportunities for regulatory agencies to direct their resources, I think we also agree on that. Um, where the technology goes from now, again, depends on the level of investments and the capacity for EPA to review and continue to review these technologies and to provide further guidance on their use and the data collection and the uh, handling and proper siting of them. And like my former, like my co-panelists, I think I agree in saying, you know, hopefully one day they do reach a capacity to be used in a regulatory purpose. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, I think we're going to close uh, close here. We had a, a one or two others uh, colleagues who are trying to get here, but there well, it's a bunch of committees that are meeting at the same time, and it's uh, uh, we got uh, a pretty good uh, bipartisan uh, cross section that uh, was able to, uh, to be here. That, and uh, I'd hope we might get one or two more, but I, I don't think we are. And so I'm going to uh, go ahead and begin to, to close this. I, I just want to thank you, you all uh, for coming today, for the time that you put into actually coming here in person, and for uh, really for the work you do with your lives and what you do for your own communities and for, uh, for your states and, and our country and, 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 and our planet. But we thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank uh, our uh, members of our staff for uh, very good work that they do week after week after week. Uh, they are, uh, I've always surrounded myself with people smarter than me. My wife says it's not hard to find them. And uh, we've got some smart cookies behind me. And uh, they, uh, the other thing that we've got going for us is they sort of like each other and they work well together. And uh, you've all heard of something called trickle down, uh, trickle down theory. And uh, I, I believe in that. I think Senator Capito does as well. And, uh, we, for the most part, work, I think, real well to, together, and, and I think that's a positive uh, influence on uh, the members of our staff. Um, the, um, uh, the, I want to maybe mention one or two other things, but I think that, um, I think we can all pretty much agree that uh, folks in this day and age shouldn't have to worry about uh, whether the, uh, the air that they breathe is, is safe for them, for their families. Uh, whether they're young or old, um, yet uh, far too many uh, communities are exposed to harmful uh, air pollution, even despite all their efforts to reduce that, uh, those threats. Fortunately, as we've learned today, the advancements in uh, low-cost air quality sensors equip uh, a lot of communities, a lot of communities, with knowledge uh, about uh, their air quality. And this knowledge is helping local policymakers uh, make uh, evidence-based decision uh, in order to improve public health further. And before we adjourn, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, materials relating to today's uh, uh, hearing. This is my favorite part of the hearing when I get to ask, make a unanimous consent request, and there's no one here to object. No other uh, senator saw so, uh, hearing no objection. The uh, uh, I'm going to move on to some uh, house, uh, keep, housekeeping. Uh, senators will be allowed uh, uh, to submit written questions for the record through the close of business on Wednesday, April 24th. And we will compile those uh, questions. We're going to send them to our witnesses and we're going to ask uh, you all to reply, if you would, by Wednesday, May the 8th. 
And uh, with that, uh, I think we'll just uh, declare this uh, hearing uh, adjourned. Thanks so much.